Welcome to Terry TV. I'm Terry Harden. How are you doing, um, Pop Icon? If you're joining me for the first time today, uh, why would anybody watch me? I guess because I have these little philosophies and look into my life and future and what I know and how you can do it too and, and how to live a good life, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, questions are, all, are welcome. Statements are welcome. Reactions are welcome. Everything's welcome as long as it's not mean. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's the truth about it. Um, I broadcast, I've been broadcasting for about oh, over four years and mainly it's just to reach out and, and touch some people. Uh, I think my, my real strength was during the pandemic when people really needed to have connections via this kind of media because we weren't getting it face to face. And I am a face to face person. So I felt that greatly myself. And uh, so this is how this all happened. Today, hi Vince. Today I'm going to talk about Ghostbusters. Um, as you notice that there's a new Ghostbusters coming out and there's been a lot of hoopla about it. Also, there's a lot of, <laughs> and what happens is if you didn't know, um, I worked on the original Ghostbusters film. It was my second film that I was fortunate to, enough to be a part of. And I helped to build the Marshmallow Man in the um, Gozer Gazarian sequence. And I also played the terror dog that Sigourney Weaver turns into. So uh, on Team Librarian Ghost as well, just uh, puppete puppeteering is often a team sport in the level that I'm at. And I think I wanted to uh, be clear on that because I'm currently taking a great um, um, course called the Academy of Puppetry with uh, Bernd. I can't remember his last name, forgive me, Bernd, but um, it is a 15 month course where you work for a month and then you have a month to catch up and uh, it's wood carving and it's very beautiful. And what Baron tells you is that he often can do some shows with one person. So I did that in my early days when I was learning puppetry, but this stuff that's Ghostbusters or Country Bears or ones that involve uh, the, the uh, Henson Ninja Turtles, these are audio animatronic puppets and they require a team. And I love doing team work puppetry with other puppeteers. I think this is what makes the uh, performing of puppets so special and the performing period special. It's like an ensemble, like acting, except for you're doing it with a hand or maybe both of your hands, but not necessarily your face in uh, these circumstances. So I was hearing a lot of um, talk about Ghostbusters because the new one's coming out. So of course I get a lot of questions. You guys send me the popcorn buckets, which are quite hilarious. Uh, I, I don't think they really... Um, you would have to tell me if you're a Ghostbusters, super Ghostbusters fan over a Disney fan, but I just think Disney, and this is a surprise for me too, takes a little more thought in creating their popcorn buckets because they've been doing them for so long. So the, the Ghostbusters ones are interesting, but you'll have to tell me if they're enough to make you pull the trigger on buying them. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm connected with a lot of groups from Ghostbusters because they've reached out to me to be interviewed as the terror dog. And a lot of times I'll tell you stories that aren't about the actual process that works, that um, has to do with Ghostbusters. But uh, I talk mostly about some of the fun things that happened to me on that series. But the question was, I looked for you in the credits. Why aren't you in the credits? And uh, so I decided to address that today and tell you the story about that today. If you're interested, it's Monday. I'm a little bit tired because my weekend was really uh, very, very, very uh, high speed because I'm taking care of some things that have to do with my family right now. So uh, not a lot of time to focus as much as I'd like to. And I have to say that uh, things will get better once the dust clears in this part of my life once the dust settles. And then of course it's Monday, which is always a big, big, uh, a big question mark. You know, you make your lists, you, you, you look on Sunday and you say to yourself, what do I need to do for this coming week? 
and you make that list. But Monday is always that red herring of a day where it just splashes in front of you and creates what it wants to. And so I am prepared for just about anything, right? Yeah. So, uh, so that's the, the, the deal, the situation. So anyway, um, let me get into my, uh, some of my, and I have to tell you that usually I would be broadcasting from my studio, but it is a little bit in shambles because I am doing some re reconfiguring, redos, re, uh, refurbishment for my art studio, as well as my, um, as well as, uh, my garage. I'm reworking my garage and, uh, yeah, there's been some, there's been a lot of stuff going on guys, but yay. Uh, uh, yay. <laughs> That's all I have to say is yay. So today, um, I am working with the, um, with the, uh, 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 Academy of Puppetry, and they mentioned a puppeteer who does not only do wood carving, but he also is very well known for his integration of soft foam. Well, if you guys know me, you know that years ago I sculpted a Yoda puppet, and that Yoda puppet uh, was all using scissors. So here he is. This is in uh, the, the 70s and 80s, or the 80s, actually. So there I am with him. And if you recognize me, this is because you were probably at one of these events where you actually saw me performing. This is called The Other Hope, shortly after Empire Strikes Back. And I won countless awards at conventions for that performance and that show, as well as people were really excited to see uh, and wanted to know how this puppet was built. So it started here with this. And if uh, we look closely, um, Yoda was carved with scissors, Fiskers to be exact. And um, he has got the clothing. He's got the little pipe. The eyes are ping pong balls. The teeth are wax. And he's a hand puppet, hand and rod puppet. So I started to do that. And then all of a sudden, ba-bam, what happened is uh, as I continue to perfect my craft as a puppeteer, people started to hear about me. People got curious about it. And uh, here I am on a card that was generated by a collector's group with my terror dog. So there I am with my dog. And uh, it was at the top of the Gozer Gazarian um, temple in the first film and also in the refrigerator and also in the closet or the doorway when Sigourney Weaver is screaming because she does not want to be possessed. I don't think I'm giving you spoiler alerts because a lot of you are so into Ghostbusters, but I thought I'd kind of share it. That head was, um, there are areas that are foam, but also it is then covered in a skin. So that's, you know, sculpted and then a mold is done. And um, it's a big one because I fit up inside it. And if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask me. Uh, but I'm going to show you the Marshmallow Man because here I am um, with the Marshmallow Man. This is uh, uh, the Marshmallow Man. Here I am standing on the side. My hair is quite interesting. I will agree. But uh, uh, here I'm also taking care of the man in the suit. Billy Bryant, he's the one that's inside. I helped to build and construct this with a team of half a dozen people. And then I performed the head by being on a cart underneath while four of us made that happen. I was as the terror dog, 40 feet in the air. And here's team terror dog, you know, a couple people, some people on radio, some people inside the suit, but there I am. And then um, on the side here is our uh, captain, um, Stuart Ziff. Maybe many of you know him and know of him from the Dykstra Flex camera, the one that made Star Wars so famous. Um, anyway, that's kind of the fun stuff I wanted to show you. Here's another one of us building them. And this is how the conversation started. Foam. So uh, there is an L200 base underneath, and then there is a foam stretched over that. This is me and Eric Fiedler. 
Uh, and I would show these better to you and I'll probably show you them again when I get in my real studio so you can see them a little better. But this is kind of fun because we are covering this Marshmallow Man in um, 100 PPI soft foam, which means you can stretch it, you can pull it, and then you pull and stretch it. Um, and depending on what direction uh, the Marshmallow Man needs to face, like if he's facing front, then the seams are in the back. And if he's facing if he's facing three quarter like this, then the seam would be on the off camera side. And then if you, you've got him his back to you, like when he's climbing the building, then the seam is in the front. And that is called Hero Marshmallow Man. Those three uh, Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. That is the Hero Marshmallow Man, and uh, they are uh, um. There are 18 burning suits because, of course, he burns and you have to do some takes. So we made a different, we made a suit that looked like him. But when he set a flame, uh, we had to have a fire retardant foam and material on top of that. Here is a picture you may be very familiar with. This has been in many magazines. This is the crew of Ghostbusters. And here I am in this corner right here in the red striped shirt so right where is my finger i gotta try and do this there we are right there that's me right there see so there i am next to the marshmallow man as he's making an expression and that's the expression that you'll see a lot of familiar faces in here as well that were involved in ghostbusters because there was a lot of talent on that film i was fortunately one of them uh what else can i tell you there was something else i was going to tell you and now it is gone from my brain, but I will remember in a minute. Oh, duh. The main thing I wanted to show you was the thing that I had in the thumbnail when this opened today, which was a list from Variety. Here it is right here. And you can't read it because, you know, it looks like, but if we zoom in, there's my name. So you can clearly see Terry Harden right there. And, uh, this is this is among the names. So if you look over here in the in the upper corner, let me just zoom in on that a little bit. Um, Ivan Reitman and Columbia Pictures. Okay, they're actually they actually took out a page, which to thank Richard Richard Edland and the see. So it they had to do this. Why did they have to do this? Because uh, the 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 industry. Um, and this is, this is the other, um, first, you know, it says for, uh, uh, service above and beyond the call of duty, the realm of possibility and producing 103, 30, 193 visual effects shots for Ghostbusters and meeting an impossible deadline. So that's what the bottom says right there. Okay. And then these are all the names that were left off the the roster off the credits. So I have a lot of good company on this. I have a lot of good, I'm in, I'm in really good company. So what happened was Richard Edland uh, wanted to be sure that, and, and he's very well known. If you don't know who he is, Google him because he's responsible for some of those films you loved as young people, as kids, as you know, he, he had a lot to do with a lot of stuff. Um, one of the movies that uh, people so, some like some don't is um, brainstorm, which I love. I'm I'm just a gaga for this movie because I have a secret crush on Christopher Walken, um, or at least I did. And then of course I married my husband, but uh, I love Christopher Walken in films. And anytime he's in one, I like to 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 um, um, watch him. And then I was fortunate to do, enough to do Big Al in the Country Bears. I actually performed him while someone else was in the suit, so I did the face again. And um, and Christopher, as you know, was opposite Big Al. So I actually got to tell him how much I was a fan of his work and, and his work. So it went full circle and I got to, to tell him how much I loved it. So so there you go. There's that. But uh, in Ghostbusters, that list that I just showed you um, was a list to prove that lots of people were left off the credits when the credits rolled on the actual film back in 1984. And, uh, and it was rough when I went to the screening, it was really difficult because when the screening was over and the credits had rolled, many people were upset and I didn't understand why. I mean, after all, it had only been my second film 
And it came out very quickly. In fact, it came out before um, um, Dune 1984 did. So I, at least I believe it did. That's the way I have it in my mind, like the Kung Fu Panda. Um, but in any case, it, it, it was it was really, really fast, and I didn't have my name in the credits. And as a puppeteer, I was kind of used to that in, in certain things because as a puppeteer, you're kind of buried near the bottom. Um, you you got to put your bunny slippers on in many cases to read the names of the puppeteers. They're kind of just above the music sometimes, and the credits can be very, very long. But in the case of Ghostbusters, they didn't want it to go long. And they found a loophole in Richard Eklund's contract. And so they took it. Producers took it. And he was very upset when he saw that the names were left off because he had actually put in his contract that he wanted us all to be named. We were all working under, as he says, a ridiculous deadline. And uh, uh, we we made it happen. There were times when we were working um, seven days a week. And the thing about seven days a week on Ghostbusters when you're working on something this this involved is that six days, you know, seven days turns into 14 days, turns into 21 days, turns into 28 days, et cetera, et cetera. And the longer it goes without a break, pardon me, the longer it goes without a break, the harder it is to stay coherent in your mind. You start to get bungee. You need, you know, there's a reason that one day in seven to rest is so important because if you don't, your body starts to say, shutting down in five, four, three, two, one, mm. you know? So even C-3PO shuts down for a while. So it's very important that we got this opportunity. And I think we were on day 22 or 23 when... um when uh, the producers came through because uh, production had slowed. I won't say it slowed to a halt on Ghostbusters, but it slowed enough to give producers concern on meeting this really scary deadline. And, um, and so they walked through the studio where we were building and we were building down at Boss, Boss B-O-S-S, Film, Maxella, and a little satellite place where we were building Marshmallow Man because he needed, because he was so white, he had to have his own area. He couldn't get, you know, he couldn't get soiled by a lot of other things that were being produced and, and made on Ghostbusters. So they moved us to an isolated area, which was kind of fun because it's where Greg Jean, and those of you who know the amazing model builder and what he has done and what he has accomplished, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, he's passed away now, but he was an amazing young man and is an amazing young man in my book. Um, Greg made the uh, made incredible models, including the final mothership in um, Close Encounters. So he's done a ton of other stuff, but I wanted to do something that maybe all of you have seen, Close Encounters. And uh, the man was always busy. The man was always uh, just incredible model builder and designer and creator. And um, he worked in this little shop. So there were remnants of things from Greg and from Richard. And one of them was Brainstorm. So I was really excited because Richard was kind enough to give me a couple of little things, little, little objects that I could have uh, from Brainstorm as a gift. And that's was and that's while I was working on Ghostbusters in that little satellite office on Ghostbusters. So the producers came around day 22, 23 of us having no break. And they saw us as they, <laughs> as they walked through, one of the consistent things that they saw was people staring at their tools. Ooh, paintbrush. Whoa, what does this do? Oh, paint. So we were really pablum brained. Our brains were mush. We were just staring into space and staring into areas, not aware because we were so, so exhausted. So the teams for Ghostbusters in these studios, uh, your Mark Stetson, et cetera, said, look, um, 
you got to give these people Richard Edlund too. You got to give these people one day and seven to the rest, or we're going to miss our deadline. And so reluctantly they gave us one day and seven to rest. And that seventh day we were able to use it for things like laundry, getting groceries, uh, maybe catching up on rest, things that were essential to keep the body strong. And uh, as it was, as a result, we were able to meet our deadline. But many people were upset at the screening that happened in Hollywood. And I thought this was the way people behaved. I was young. I didn't know how people behaved at a screening. I had been at some screenings, but never one that I was actually involved in at the time. And I noticed that people didn't talk to each other. We were always talking and smiling and carrying on. Even though the deadline was really, really challenging, um, we were on Ghostbusters really friendly having fun. And so here I was at a screening and I would say, Hey, how you doing? And afterwards, after the, you know, cause it goes busters, you're shaking hands and you're all excited because you want to see how the movie turned out. And, uh, and we were very excited after it because it was cool, but we didn't speak to each other. And I would say, Hey, how you doing? And people would just kind of have this face like, and I thought, Oh, maybe you're not, friends after, but I was mistaken. Let me say that again. I was seriously mistaken because I've often said that when an, something happens and you're a part of it, you, you as a human being tend to make it about yourself, don't we? We tend to figure, oh, they must not like me or what did I do to upset them? I thought we were cool, this kind of a thing. And it really wasn't anything to do with me. And this is what I'm saying. It's not always about you and it's not always about me, you know? Um, some of you out there might get upset because a text isn't answered right away. But if you're texting someone like myself, who is extremely busy with a lot going on, you need to know that I will, I will respond to you, but it may not be immediately because I have this aversion to my phone. I'm going to be real for you. I tend to lock my phone as far away from me as possible, but texting is still the best way to get me because eventually I've got to pick up my phone, don't I? To make a call. Hello. So I will see your text eventually, but lots going on. It's the best way to reach me. I've turned, I've realized, and you can very much post in the comments if you agree. Texting seems the way to seems to be the way to get people nowadays. A lot of people don't seem to work with email. They have email, but they don't seem to respond as readily as they do with texting. Let me know if you agree or whatever. But that, I'm just saying that with Ghostbusters, this was the situation. And this is Ghostbusters, the original I'm talking about. Um, on Ghostbusters, everyone was was not speaking to each other. And a week later, we had a rap party because we didn't have time to have a rap party. We were working. To get Ghostbusters together took, took an act of God. Forgive, the, I mean, it was magical that we got it done when we were supposed to. But we didn't get to do a wrap party, so we had a lovely wrap party on the beach, and uh, I took uh, I took a plus one, and we walked up to uh, Richard Edland, and we spoke to him. He happened to be at a at a, a bar at, at this at this restaurant we were at, and we said to him, you know, hey, how you doing? And he said, uh, I'm doing great. Uh, I want to apologize to you. And we were like, us. You're Richard Edlund. What do you have to apologize for? And Richard Edlund said, your names were your name wasn't in the credits. And we were like, oh, well, yeah, we, this is because we thought we were new to the industry. And although we are members of the Screen Actors Guild, we should have had our name in the credits. That is often up to the producers. So we 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 I get it. And he says, no, no, that's not the truth. That's not the deal. He said uh, uh, they were supposed to include all of you. I had it in my contract to include all of you. And um, they found a loophole. And I can attest to you, Scouts Honor, uh, that um, Disney has done a similar thing to me at one point. They found a loophole. And uh, they did something that I wish, I didn't mind them doing it, but I wish they would have asked me to do it instead of doing it on their own. Uh, if you want to know that, what that is, you can ask me at another time since we're focusing on Ghostbusters today. But um but he apologized. And I said, oh, what, why? You know, why are you apologizing to me sort of thing? And he said, I left so many names. So many names were left off 
that maybe you noticed at the screening, everybody was really angry. Yeah, I did. He said, well, they were upset because I had promised. I had promised them, Richard Edlund had promised everyone their name would be in the credits. So when it wasn't there, uh, they were furious. And so it had nothing to do with yours truly at all. It had to do with the fact that Richard Edlund had been bunked. And so he announced that he and Ivan Reitman were going to take out a full page ad in Variety. And those of you who are not familiar with the trade magazines of uh, the entertainment field, Variety is number one. And I think it's still number one, but they might be more digital now. I haven't read them in a while. But I will tell you, it used to be a magazine that that every actor got. Every performer, anyone in the industry, we got Variety. It was just a staple, okay? And so there was that full page ad there. And uh, uh, I saw my name and I cir uh, and that's why you get to see it. Um, there it is circled to show that I did it. Um, the reason many people are upset is because I, IMDb has trouble recognizing you as part of Ghostbusters and putting it on your credits. And you know, the internet movie database is where a lot of people go to check and see who has done what on where. But I don't have my name on Ghostbusters. And I'm not sure I have it on Dune um, simply because these are situations where that occurred. Doesn't mean you didn't do it, just means you didn't get a credit for it. The good news is I did get paid and continue to get paid. So when you think about what battles do you fight, um, you know, you just kind of say, okay, you know, but I have pictures. People have been kind enough to have taken pictures and I've taken a few pictures, but my own, um, I don't take a lot of pictures because it's my colleagues. So a lot of times when I have the opportunity to be with, when I was with Bill, uh, when I was with um, 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 Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray, we did not take pictures together. These were my working people. So I really didn't think about taking pictures at the time. I was just really grateful to be working opposite such great talent. Um, Sigourney Weaver, who in her stocking feet has got to be over six foot tall. And she was wearing a beautiful uh, black and red checkered coat and carrying a box of, a box of cookies that her mother had had sent her from New York and she was sharing them with us uh, because we got awful close to Christmas when we were shooting. And so she, she bid us this special joy from these cookies that she had gotten sent to her all the way from New York from her, by her mother. Um, it was just precious. Those are the kind of moments that I remember are those charming moments. The time we went over to Ernie Hudson's, he's loved to barbecue. And so he would often invite the cast to his home and he would do an amazing barbecue. And it was a chance for all of us to see the non-working side of us. Now, a lot of times your Dan Arkroyds and your Bill Murrays didn't go. But if they did, it was fun to kind of get the opportunity to chat with them and stuff. But the main thing was getting to talk to Ernie because uh, Ernie's experience on Ghostbusters was different. It was more like my own. It was kind of, ex it was really exciting. And, 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 and I mean, he had done a lot of stuff before. He's been an actor for, uh, I'd been an actor for a while, but not in things like Ernie was. But it was just great because he was, he was more like a friend, you know, than looking at, wow, look at, Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray up there. Now, Bill Murray used to like to punk me a lot. So I'm a very gullible person, I guess. And he saw that. So he had a lot of fun playing tricks on me and stuff. But uh, this is why I wanted to chat with you and show you this today. And I hope you enjoy that little note of, of uh, that little tidbit of Ghostbusters um, as you go into seeing the new Ghostbusters, which looks pretty good. Looks like it's a lot of computer generated, but I've heard that it's kind of mixed. So I'm looking forward to seeing it when it comes out. One of the things about the new Ghostbusters, every time they release a new Ghostbusters or a cartoon about Ghostbusters or a game about Ghostbusters or whatever, people go and watch the original of which I'm a part of. So I'm always grateful to the brand and how big it's grown. I also love seeing you all out there that love Ghostbusters and cosplay Ghostbusters. I see little kids that weren't even born 
at the time of Ghostbusters dressing up like the Marshmallow Man or one of the Ghostbusters. This year for Halloween, many people came by and saw me dressed as Ghostbusters to show me what they had come up with. It was very, very flattering. It's very touching when you know a film that you worked on means so much to people. And it touches my heart every time. And I love being interviewed about things like Ghostbusters, Country Bears, Men in Black Want to Do, The Flintstones, the dinosaur show I did with Henson's for full over four years. Um, all of that is very touching and warm and warms my heart as you guys speak on things that you like and you love. So, so uh, that's mainly what I wanted to do. And now I'll go to your comments. Uh, Vince, great to see you. Sorry we didn't get to see each other in person today. And I'm wishing you all good wishes, all magic going your way, buddy. Chris, how the heck are you? We need to connect, buddy. I, I apologize with everything that's going on. I'm hanging on just to do art for 10 minutes a day. And I'm really feeling the, the, the bite, you know, the bite of not being able to, my, to endorse my creative side because I have to be the adult in the room. So I'd love to have a conversation with you all. I'll text you and just kind of, you know, get that. Things to do in Denver when you're dead. Love walking. <laughs> yes, yes. I tend to watch uh, any Christopher Walken movie I can, good and bad, just because he's he's a lot of fun to watch as a performer. Um, I fell in love with him in Brainstorm because he wears a pair of overalls without a shirt, and uh, he looks just like my husband. So uh, I just was like, this reminds me of you when I see Christopher Walken walking around and he's got paint and he's doing something you know, fun. reminds me of my husband. So uh, it kind of tickles me. And my husband does a great impression of Christopher Walken when he talks. So it just touches my heart really well. So uh, kind of, kind of cool, but I, I like this movie too. Not sure how the pay was back then, but at least you, you'd have a, you'd have a credit. You'd think you would, uh, uh, you really would Desiree, but honestly, I have a credit. It's just in variety. So um, anytime people are questioning it, I pull this up and circle my name because I wasn't alone in, in being out of the credits. Um, and the pay was wonderful. The pay was, it, it's great to be a part of a hit film. It was great at the time, at the time. When it released in 1984, uh, uh, it, it, it was a big deal. And it, it it's still a big deal with a lot of, I mean, you know, it's still a big deal with a lot of people, but the residuals go down, you know, as the movie gets older, your um, residuals kind of taper and, you know, somewhat level off. So, but no apologies. It is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, so it's a wonderful movie. I'm, I'm so proud to be a part of it and so honored that so many love it to this day. People will come up and talk to me about it and ask me about what how it was. And I'm interviewed on it. I tell the stories over and over and over again, and I'm happy to do so. It was a lot of fun and a, a huge blessing in my life. So I'm really glad to have, have gotten that opportunity. I am good, Mike. Thank you for popping in and asking me how I'm doing. Uh, and I know that this was kind of a short and sweet little explanation for you guys today. But I just wanted you to know that uh, it's a Monday and sometimes Mondays can go a little short because Mondays have a mind of their own. More than any other day during the week, I have found that Monday is the most volatile, the most unexpected, the one that you're not prepared to get. <laughs> the one that it doesn't matter how much you prepare, you get thwunked, you know? <laughs> so um, I, I just am ready for anything. I think like a cat. Which way do I have to go? Which way is Monday going to throw me today? So that's Monday for me, actually. <laughs> Audrey, how are you? I miss you, girl. Great to hear from you. So exciting. Thank you for coming. I'm excited that you're all here, but a couple of you pop in every so often, and it's really great to see you. Ron Kabbalah, what's up? What's up? Watching the SAGs Awards, it was mentioned how Streisand had the ending of the way we were changed in 2023 releases. Might sound Pollyanna-ish, but with the current SAG atmosphere, maybe Sony can uh, rectify the credits issue. 
uh, is a studio can change the ending of the film. If a studio can change the ending of a film 50 years later, they could easily alter the credits. That's really interesting. Um, I'm not a big fan of changing the ending of stuff, but I guess if you got the power, you might as well. It'd be interesting to see what the new ending is like. Uh, I'd love to see the credits in Ghostbusters. I really would love it. If, 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 and here's the big if, Ron. Ready? Don't change a thing about Ghostbusters. Just add to the credits if you so choose. Or do a big giant shot of the variety page. And you'll be done. That fast. And then people can read where we are there. But but just leave Ghostbusters as it is because that's what's so lovely about it. I've always felt melancholy about Star Wars because although it is George Lucas's film and he has the right to change episodes four, five, and six, it, they are his movies. And at technology has, of course, advanced quite a bit. But But that's the charm of the original Star Wars is there are things in the original Star Wars that inspired me to be the artist that I am today. And so when he redid little things, he did little changes like the do back and the and the um, and the 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 stormtrooper sitting on him don't move in the original film, but in the, his little redo they do. I just wish he'd kept both. You know, my husband always says that when you're editing, you keep you know when you edit something, you keep the original and the version that you change it to. You name it differently and keep both. And if you change it a third time, you name that differently and keep. All three. Are you following his message here? His message here is in case someone says, I'd really like to go back. If you've edited over or messed with your original, you have no place to go back to. And uh, with the original Star Wars, I would love a DVD with the original that aired in 1977. Now, I did get to see uh, I guess it was last year, I was invited to the a screening of the only 70 millimeter untouched 1977 film that exists today. And I about cried because I know this film. I have seen this film 183 times, plus, 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 plus. I'm known for seeing it that much. I'm in tons of, of articles and magazines, including Skywalking, the story of George Lucas. So I know what I'm saying. And I know that I could not believe that film. It really touched me just because it's the one that made a difference in my life. You follow me? So I see what Ron is saying here, but I hope that Barbara didn't change all of the, you know, the original just have, now you can see the one from when she did the way we were. And now the new version, you can go, Hey, there you go. I get to see both and, and kind of compare them if you want. But my husband has always said, be careful. Don't alter your original. Always keep that intact. And I hope uh, George Lucas heeds those words and maybe does a DVD where I can have the intact version. Happy Monday from Mars. <laughs> from Mars. Oh, Walt. Walt from JPL. Thank you, Walt. I still have to see the back half of the tour. Um, Walt was kind enough, Walt Hoffman and um, and uh, his friend and associate and fellow rocket scientist, Bob Lineweaver, invited me to tour JPL a couple years ago. And I didn't get to see the back half of the full tour. I didn't get to see the full tour because I was shooting a show. So this is going to sound really pretentious, but I'm going to tell you anyway. So the limo had to pick me up at JPL to take me to the airport to leave in time to shoot my show. And uh, my show, <laughs> a show that I was on, not my show. Uh, see, I told you it was going to sound pretentious. But anyway, uh, I had to do that. So I have still yet to see the back half. So I've told them I will work, arrange with them as soon as some dust clears from my life uh, and go and see them because it is a great, uh, a great tour. And if you haven't done it, I highly recommend it. It's it's wonderful. Thank you, Walt. Great to see you today. Uh, have a great Monday, kiddo. Time to go be an adult. I get it. No one knows that better than myself this time. So you go and my heart is with you, my friend. Hello, Mike. Hi, Terry. And every game show bonus round. I like the part when the game show host says you have 60 seconds on the clock. Is that what you're telling me now? 
Mike, is I have 60 seconds uh, to tell you I'm so glad we had this time together. Um, anyway, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know it's a very short uh, thing today, but like I told you, it's Monday. Monday can be crazy. And I have a pile of things I need to do, but I did want to peek in and talk with you really quickly because I miss, you know, I feel a void. I have to be honest with you. I feel a void when I don't get to talk to you and my tribe um, each, each Monday and each Friday. And so when I have to say there's no broadcast, that's because something has come across the bow that I could not control and could not get a hold of it in time to actually do both. So I appreciate your tolerance and understanding, and I appreciate your love and, and joy that you send my way. And I, I want to turn around and do the same for you. Um, here, uh, Ron says, yes, they did clarify the Streisand edit was released with the re-release of the original for the anniversary. Isn't that great? That's great, right? But don't touch Ghostbusters. Just add credits, even if after original credits, like they add international dubs, etc. Exactly. That would be fun. That would really be fun. And I love that idea, Ron. And it's very sweet of you to think of that. Um, I did want to encourage you to paint this year for the Chuck Jones Society um, for Creativity, the red dot. I always enjoy your paintings. So I hope you'll paint too. Anyone can paint on this. That doesn't mean Ron is anyone. He's a very good painter, an amazing painter. But you don't have to be an amazing painter to submit to the Chuck Jones Red Dot Auction. So if you want to just paint something or draw something on a 12 by 12 in Kansas to help a charity that helps children learn about animation of all kinds and illustration of all kinds, please join us all from Terry's Tribe and from Terry's channel to submit to the Chuck Jones Red Dot Auction. Please tell them when you inquire that you heard it from Terry Harden. I don't get anything special from it, but I do get a pat on the back because I love this charity. And, uh, and they're so excited when they see someone is really sharing the message and the joy of the Red Dot Auction. I've been a member of it for over seven years. I would really like you guys to be a part of it. Uh, you can learn all about it, and I do talk about it extensively on my tribe page. So if you're interested in checking it out, uh, go to uh, patreon.com slash Terry Harden, and I'll post it up in a minute. But thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for saying that, Ron. That makes me feel a whole lot better, and I agree with you. Uh, uh, miss you, Julie Hoffman. I do. I do, Julie. I miss you too. We need to get together and have some, some footage. And then Susan writes, yeah, <laughs> I love you. Let me just quickly show you the banner here. So you can see patreon.com slash Terry Harden for $5 a month. You can, uh, I should say for as little as $5 a month, you can get two broadcasts Monday and Friday, a zoom call, which happens various days. This time it's going to be on Friday. And, um, and, uh, uh, I hope to see you there. Uh, it is a great place for us to share and be good to people. Um, this one is good too, but this is, you know, I go into stronger detail on the Patreon page. So I hope you consider it. Uh, please think about it. Um, you can always try it. And if you don't like it, we're not going to get after you. If you decide not to be a part of it, that's your business. So, um, but we, you should at least try it like uh, spinach and broccoli. You should at least give it a try. You never know. <laughs> Cause we're more like uh, ambrosia. <laughs> I like coconut. So anyway, guys do something nice for someone else. It'll make you feel a whole lot better. And I always end my broadcast with this, but here's why. When you do something for someone else, for example, a painting, you're going to have such joy painting, even if in your own heart you think this painting isn't great. They'll, they want a painting and you would be surprised how many people will buy your painting and that feels good too, but all proceeds go to the Red Dot Auction and the Red Dot Auction is all about Chuck Jones Society uh, of creativity. So I really, really hope you will consider it. If you want to learn more, um, 
I will post a little bit as we get closer. Um, but um, I wanted to let everyone know everyone can do it. And you don't have to paint a Chuck Jones themed painting. You, if you like flowers or you like landscapes or you like whatever you like. And this year they're honoring um, the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote, Acme and the Desert. So you could do so many different things with those things. You could do a, a, a landscape of the desert and people would probably love it. Uh, you could do an anvil. <laughs> I remember last year, someone did a still life and it was kind of like Acme products that the coyote would use. It was very clever. And so, you know, you just think out of the box and have some fun and, uh, and you will enjoy it. Okay. All right. I love you guys. Hugs to you guys. Um, and, uh, I will be seeing you, uh, Friday. Okay. All right. Be well, be safe. Bye for now. I'm still waving, huh? Let's try it again.